Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fifth and final talk about centrality. We're looking in this series at how we build up a sense of being a person or a self, an individual or a me in the world. We've looked at how what I call the brain body contributes an ongoing narrative and how the heart body provides information about the quality of our connections to other people and other beings. We looked at how the earth body, the lower belly and pelvic region, provides an ongoing backdrop of orientation toward this planet that gave us birth as individuals and as a species. In this final talk, we'll bring all of these together in a meditative and contemplative way so that it can become part of your daily practice, both in times of formal meditation and times when you're in the world and you want to reorient toward a deeper and fuller understanding of what it is to be a human organism on Earth. Let's begin. So we have been looking at this topic of centrality and how we build up, by virtue of our biology, a sense of being an individual in a world. As mentioned in the first talk, this individuality is only partial, but it does play an important role in how we navigate our experiences. And so it's worth examining, not just conceptually, but also in meditation. Recall that we looked at the brain and how this animation simulates the activity of the brain where each little sparkle that we see represents the firing of a single nerve cell, and that the amount of activity in this simulation is only about one one millionth of the actual activity in a human brain. And this simple sparkling pattern that we see here glosses over all the complex interactions that are underway in the nervous system. Still, it does give the flavor of how active the brain and body are. Within the brain are nerve cells that are highly branched and that connect with one another in complex ways, each nerve cell connecting with a thousand to ten thousand other nerve cells. If we zero in on some of these branches, we can see them firing in real time in this experimental preparation where the cell has been designed to fluoresce when it undergoes electrical activity. And if we zoom in on the branches at even higher scale, we can animate our movement through them. This animation is a little artificial because it looks as if there are open spaces between the various twigs of the various nerve cells when in fact the whole frame would be completely packed with nerve processes. Each color here is meant to represent a different nerve cell and you can see how much interaction there is between the cells. And if you add in the full density of the packing, you can really get a sense as to how complex brain activity is. This gets even more obvious when we look at the scale of this. To the right, I've added a grain of salt. And if we adjust the relative sizes of the animation and the grain of salt to approximate their real proportions, we can see how what we're looking at as we fly through the nerve processes is very, very small, since this is, after all, just a single grain of salt and we're looking at a tiny subfraction of that volume in this animation. Somehow, our sense of me is built out of all of this interaction, using information from other people, from the surroundings, from our biology itself. Somehow or another, the idea that I am a me in the world comes out of all of this. Ultimately, how that's done remains quite mysterious, although, of course, science has made some progress. 
I like to look at this as living within a biological garden. So this is a garden of life that exists within my body and your body and somehow grows up this sense of me out of all that complexity, all that activity. One thing that it does in all that growing life is tell a kind of story about who I am in the world. And so my sense of self in a certain way is a storyline or narrative that I use to explain what I remember of my life history, of my past. And I also employ it to deal with situations as they arrive. They, this story gives me a sense of knowing who I am and how to respond. And some of this is conscious, a lot of it is not. But there is a way in which the brain is continually building out a story of the self in the world. This has to do with a lot of aspects of our experience, not just our body and mind, but also things like our education, our belief system, our social connections, our past successes and failures, the things that we consider to be ours, our possessions, activities and locations that we inhabit, and just a whole slew of preferences. Somehow or another, all that gets packed into this idea of me and into the story I tell about myself. The neuroscience seems to indicate that there are brain regions that are characteristically activated when we ruminate on ourselves and tell the story of me. Here we see a representation of those regions. Collectively, they're referred to as the default mode network. The technical name and even the precise regions, I think, are unimportant for our purposes. The main point I want to make is that there is a pattern of activation in our brains and in our bodies that reflect this ongoing story that we tell about ourselves and our experiences. Sometimes these stories are quite tragic and sad with lots of trauma and uproar, conflict, and sometimes they are happier, more idyllic. Either way, the story has a kind of origin in all of that neural activity and complexity that we've looked at. What's even more striking is that the storyteller, this idea of being a person who knows all about myself and knows the story of my life, that also is arising in some complex and not yet understood way from all this neural activity. And so this can be the first point of meditation. We can settle into a comfortable posture and bring our attention to our breathing. And notice how the body expands in its core with in-breath and settles back without breath. And after a few calm breaths, we can take stock of the story we're currently telling ourselves. We know, each of us, where we are, perhaps, in our home. We know what time of day it is. We have a sense of having just done some things and an idea that before long we'll be doing other things. And all of this feels like background knowledge. just things we know about where we are, when we are, what has happened, and what is likely to happen. But all of that has a story-like quality. There's a sense in which there's a sequence of events 
in mind. Some remembered, some felt right now, in the brief time we call the present, and some imagined. Feeling into that place in the head, up above and behind the eyes is where it often feels, where the story gets told. We don't need to dwell on the details of any of it right now, any of it right now. Just take in the fact that a story is somewhere in mind. There's a sense of knowing where I am and who I am and so on. See if you can feel how that vibrates a bit in your awareness. We never hold one aspect of it in mind for very long. And we don't hold the whole thing in mind either. There's a sense in which different scenes pop up and then drift away. Your own experience will be your experience, not exactly what I or anyone else describe. But just notice how this sense of knowing where you are what you've done recently and what you might do after watching this video. How easy it is to have that sense of a life with a past, a present, and a future. How automatic it is to orient to this story that we're all of us telling ourselves much of the time. Feel how it has its own aliveness, its own tendency to form and change, progress. How different sub-narratives sometimes get triggered. How sometimes the mind gets distracted from the main storyline to some remembered story further in the past or imagined one further in the future. Just watch the mind as it makes sense of where you are, who you are, and what you're doing. See if you can feel how it is an aliveness that leads to all this. See if you can contemplate into how this is a garden of life that you're living within, that vibrates and resonates with what you've experienced through your senses and through your life and creates this meaning that we call an ongoing sense of self, a story of who you are both right here and now, and over longer arcs of time. Just see if you can feel this as a living, adaptive intelligence. A gift, perhaps, of your biology. See if this might feel a bit like awe. Is there something rather remarkable and mysterious in having this experience right now? This is a nice practice that can be done anytime, but we'll move on. Having looked at how the me is partially the responsibility of the narrative functions of that complex tissue we call a brain, 
We'll now move down into what I call the heart body, the relational core. And we'll focus on that for a bit. The relational core is something we each of us possess, and it's a very sensitive region that responds to changing social dynamics. In particular, it's tuned to respond to feelings of support and love or to their absence. When we feel supported and safe, when our needs are largely met, we feel a warm and full sensation that we might call contentment or happiness. Of course, sometimes that's not what we feel. We feel agitated, on edge. We might feel angry and aggressive or frightened and fearful, withdrawing. Either way, very activated, very hyper vigilant, vigilant. Sometimes we feel rejected or we're in a state of bereavement or loss or we feel dispirited or discouraged, rather deflated and drooping. The relational core serves up these various feeling states, and these contribute a lot to our sense of being a self in the world, because they provide an evaluation of how am I doing, particularly in a social way, which for social creatures like ourselves is usually the most important issue. We can meditate with this in our hearts and minds. So moving your attention now down from the area of the storyline and the thinking brain to the tender heart. Feeling back into the breathing the movement of the chest forward and up on inhalation and back and down on exhalation. If the breathing is quiet, this might be a rather subtle movement, but we can feel it. And just notice what is the quality of feeling tone in your body core at this moment. It doesn't need to be described in words. You could just feel the raw sensation of it as it vibrates and changes. But you might ask whether there is a sense of fullness or emptiness. Coolness or warmth. lightness or heaviness. A sense of expansiveness or contraction. Just feeling into the relational core. We don't need to explain why we feel this way. We can just let the body Tell us how it's doing. With curiosity and caring, we can just listen to this ongoing resonance that our body sets up that lets us know how it feels in social terms and how it feels in terms of safety and wellness. This can be a nice way to take the measure of a moment, just feeling the intuitive response of the organism. And so it's something that can be done not only in meditation, but also when we're evaluating some situation involving other people. It can allow us to access more of our innate intuitive intelligence. But this sensation can be 
set aside for now. And we can now move, having covered the head body and the sense of me in the heart body, we can move down to the lower belly and pelvis and start to bring in the final of the three components, what I refer to as the earth body. This is the part of our organism that connects us with the earth and reminds us that we are not separate from her. And so we will focus now on the earth body. Wherever we go and whatever we do, there's always a sense of the earth beneath us. We may not have this very consciously in mind, but we know which way is down and which way is up which is to say we know and feel the earth below our feet or below our sitting bones or beneath us as we lie in bed. It is an ongoing, steady part of our experience. The body has systems that orient it in this way and let us know where the earth is relative to our current position. Some of them are in the inner ear, the semicircular canals that we see here, as well as the bulbous area at their base. So that's inside the head, part of the same apparatus that provides hearing, which is the coiled bit below. But there are structures in the skin that detect pressure and vibration, and these also orient us. We feel the pressure of the earth, or the vibration of our feet hitting the earth as we walk. And there are sensors and bones and muscle and tendons that help us know the position of our limbs, again, relative to the earth. Together, they provide a function that could be considered like a gyroscope. That is to say, something that maintains an orientation regardless of how the body may be knocked off kilter relative to the position of the planet. It allows us to always know which way is down which way the earth is relative to where we are and how we're positioned now. This feeds into this ongoing sense of being an earthly being oriented toward a planet that supports us, not just biologically with air and food and water, but also physically as we move and walk and run and dance. And so the pelvis, which is in this region of the earth body, is really our locomotory center. It's where the spine rises, and it's where the large bones of the thigh, the lower legs, articulate. It provides the basis for all movement and allows us to walk with grace and perhaps joy upon the earth. I like to remember this feeling of the earth below, the steadiness of it, and think of it as, in a sense, providing me an extension to my body image, one that includes the presence of the planet at all times. And so that I can rest upon the earth with a sense of wholeness and largeness that goes beyond the sometimes fraught experience of being a smallish organism dwarfed by the vast world around us. As we begin to feel more a part of the earth, we feel less fragmented, more whole. And this can be the final point of meditation. So settling back into that comfortable posture and feeling now the breath in the lower belly. Uh, there's an expansion and contraction as breath moves in and out. See if you can feel the smooth flow of the body as it breathes especially here in the lower belly. And feel how the lower belly connects 
to the pubic bone in front and to the hip bones on the sides and the spine in the back and the sacrum and the sitting bones. How there's a sense in which the pelvic bowl upholds the lower breathing belly. Feel the weight of the sitting bones against the furniture or floor. And notice how aware you are of which direction is down, how obvious it is. You can feel the pressure of the earth upholding your body and your belly, your sitting bones, your feet, etc. And more than that, you just have this ongoing background knowledge about where the floor is, where the earth is, below you, beneath this body right now. Feel into that sense that there is an earth below, that your body is resting on this layer of the earth we call its crust, where the rock and soil rest. See if you can imagine that there are little roots or little tendrils or blood vessels that connect you to the depths of earth below. Maybe they grow out from below your body or maybe they grow up from the earth into this human organism. Feeling into that sense of ongoing connection and awareness. There is this earth, ever present, a steady and stable part of bodily existence. And just as you can feel into the soles of your feet and into the skin around your sitting bones and hips. You can also feel into the earth upon which they rest as you feel downward, following the lines of those tendrils and vessels, the roots and connections that we could imagine, but also in a certain sense, can feel. Letting the earth become part of your experience. And this can be done now or anytime in quiet meditation. But it can also be done at more active times of day for a sense of grounding and stability. Trusting the earth.